said to me, Noelle, if you hate this business or if you fail, the worst case is you know how to manage money for the rest of your life. And that was an invaluable lesson. So I'm so excited that you guys are learning how to manage money for, for the rest of your life because it's such a critical lesson. So I applaud you for doing that. I find the markets to be so fascinating, whether North Korea sends a missile, how they interpret Janet Yellen's minutes from her FOMC meeting, what retail sales were like, or um, you know what the you know economic latest economic data was. There's so many things that affect the market, and so you never really master that. And so I've been a student of the market for the last 30 years, and so my challenge is. How do I cram 30 years worth of material in just an hour? But I'll do my best. So here's, here's the sobering truth, is that so few people are on track uh, financially. And so that's why I get so excited when you're a part of this class and you're learning how to manage money and how to save and invest. Because the truth is that 60% of the population, no matter what age, can't even manage a $500 emergency. And, and when I first started in the workforce, most companies offered a, a defined benefit plan, so they would set money aside for you for retirement. Now the onus is on you. You may get a match to your 401k if you're lucky, but most of you will be required to fund your own retirement. The average Social Security uh, annual income is 16000 Again, with a daughter in college, that would last me maybe two months. Uh, the savings rate in other parts of the country, even third world countries, is so much higher than here in the U.S. Do you know what the savings rate is here in the U.S.? 5.7%. Yeah, 5.7%, exactly. Three quarters of the people are underfunded towards their retirement. I know that's the last thing on your mind is retirement, but nevertheless, it's going to creep up on you, um, and we'll address that in a couple minutes. People spend more time planning a three-hour wedding than they do their 30-year retirement and 60% of the population fail the basic investment literacy test. So that's why I applaud you. You're taking control of your finances. You're learning how to manage money for the rest of your life. So today we're gonna to cover savings, the difference between savings and investing, investing in the stock market, diversification, and other techniques. So I don't know how sophisticated you are in terms of your knowledge, so I don't wanna uh, talk over your head. I don't wanna be overly simplistic, so bear with me as I, I do my best to navigate the different uh, levels of knowledge. They're just starting. So okay. we, we kind of kicked it off in, in a uh, very overview fashion on Thursday, so they had some, some understanding. Perfect. So figure they're kind of at a base level. Perfect, okay, okay. sounds great. So when you give your money to the bank, that's considered savings. It's not considered investing. Because what does a bank do? They turn around and issue a mortgage to somebody, charging them 4%, but yet they're going to pay you one. So who keeps that spread? Obviously, your bank does. But there's a purpose behind a savings account. Can anybody tell me what the benefit is to having a savings account? Liquidity, you can access your funds immediately. One more benefit, thank you. Your principal is guaranteed. So let's say you put your money in the stock market, it's 2008, you go to access your funds and your money's down 50%, your assets are down 50%. And you you know, found a, your dream house and now you've got half of what you originally had. So there's a purpose behind a savings account and that's for an emergency fund. And you should have three to six months worth of living expenses uh, in, in a bank savings account or money market account, okay? So that's the rule of thumb. So the guarantee is important, but the problem is after taxes and inflation, you're guaranteed to lose money safely. So you don't wanna keep more than that, <coughs> okay? So now we want to invest to stay ahead of inflation. So what is inflation? The erosion of your purchasing power over time, right? So it's the increase in the cost of goods and services. So it may not seem like a huge impact, right? Because it's been running around 2 to 3%. But look at the impact that it has over time. So if I'm age 55 and I retire with $100,000, 
Um, and I decide to keep my money in the bed, I'm sorry, under the mattress, that 100,000 at just a 3% inflation rate turns into 40,000 at age 85. Now my living expenses haven't been cut by two thirds. As a matter of fact, my healthcare expenses are going up at twice the inflation rate. So do you see how inflation can erode your principal over time? So it's critical that we stay up ahead of inflation and the way to do that is to invest in the stock market. Another way to look at it is this when a lot of your grandparents were born. And so looking back at 1938, the cost of a new house was $3,900. The average annual income was $1,700. I started working in, um, I'm trying to think, 1985, 83, and my annual salary was 16,800, which is probably equivalent to 60,000 today. I'm not sure, I haven't done the math. A new car is $860 and the average rent $27 per month, Harvard tuition $420. So you can see again how much that's changed just in the last you know, 70 years or 80 years. So we have to save ahead of inflation by investing in the stock market. And, and you weren't around, but back in the early 80s during the Reagan administration, the inflation rate got up to 14%. Uh, but on average, uh, the inflation rate is 3.87%, okay? So one reason we're investing in the stock market is because of compounding. Can anybody tell me what compounding means? Interest on interest and interest on principal. Exactly, thank you. So you're earning interest on interest and earning interest on principal. And somebody said it's the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it. He who does it, pays it. Who gave, who quote, whose quote is that? No, Albert Einstein. So compound interest, he said, was the eighth wonder of the world. And how do you, who's, who's paying interest? What is the worst form of interest? Compounding interest you could pay. Yes. What'd you say? Credit cards. Yes. One of you said credit cards. Exactly. So compound interest. So if you've seen this, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But if I were to say, I'm going to give you a penny and I'm going to double it every day for a month, or you can choose a million dollars, what would you choose? Penny doubled every day. Yeah, anybody else? So look at the effects of compounding. A penny doubled every day equals over $5 million at the end of 30 days. And that is the beauty of compounding. So congratulations for choosing that. Now, if you hear about an investment that doubles every day, I want in on it. It simply doesn't exist, but it just shows you a powerful illustration of how compounding can work. Um, have any of you heard of the rate of uh, the rule of seventy-two? Okay, great. Fantastic. Okay, so we'll just skip that. So now let's talk about the stock market. So all of you know what the stock market is. It's just ownership in a publicly traded company. So there's private equity or private businesses, so that's the dry cleaner or the family owned bookstore, but a publicly traded company is, you'll hear the interchangeably equity or you know stocks, they're, they're uh, the same. So you're part owner in a company, obviously you're not involved in the day-to-day -day management, but you do have voting rights as a common shareholder. So by buying a share of Amazon, you become an owner of Amazon. Um, so, if we go back and look at the long-term averages of stocks, so if we go back to 1947, and let's say your grandparents had invested $10,000 on your behalf, look what it'd be worth today in small company stock. It'd be worth $49.5 million because of the effects of compounding, compounding. exactly. Now, if you'd invested in large company stocks, so the S&P 500, it'd be worth 13 million. Now, the difference between the returns of small company stocks and large company stocks 
is about 2.5%. But year over year, that makes an incredible difference over time, as you can see. So large company stocks, $13 million. Small company stocks at $10,000 would be worth $49 billion. Bonds, $645 million. T-bills, $165, and inflation, $106. And so you, you've heard of dividends. Dividends is just the quarterly income that stocks pay. Not all stocks pay dividends. So for example, Amazon and Facebook don't pay dividends. It doesn't make them a bad stock. They're considered growth stocks or dividend paying stocks. So there's, so almost think of it this way. I have, I want to buy a piece of rental property. I want appreciation or growth, but I also want to collect the rent, right, from my tenant. So those two things combined, it's total return. So you have growth or appreciation when that stock goes up in value, and you have income or rent when that stock pays a quarterly dividend. And again, not all stocks pay quarterly dividend. But dividends over the long haul have accounted for about half of the return of the stock market. As you can see, so without dividends, you'd have 241,000 with dividends, 986,000. Can anybody tell me what the dividend is on the S&P 500 today? Guess, guess what it is. It's considerably lower than that 4%. It's only about 1.8, between 1.8 and 1.9%. So it's quite a bit lower. Companies today are hoarding a lot of cash. For example, Apple has a quarter of a trillion dollars in cash and the stock market has appreciated. So as a result, that percentage looks a lot lower because stocks have appreciated so much. Does that make sense so far? And 2% is a lot better than the bank. Yeah, exactly. It's also, it depends on the environment for some of you, right? Exactly right. So you're getting 2%, but hopefully appreciation over time as well, right? So now, you know, sometimes, especially older individuals will say, yes, but stocks are risky. Because remember, they've been through many crashes. They went through the 1974-75 crash, the 87 crash, the 2008 crash, the 1999-2000 tech bubble. So they've been through a lot. So a lot of them have become very risk adverse. So here's how I reassure them. I say to them, okay, you woke up this morning and you turned your alarm off on your Apple phone. Apple was $5 a share back in 2000. It's at $153 today. You jumped in the shower, washed yourself off with head and shoulder shampoo made by Procter & Gamble, a 180 year old company that's been paying dividends for 126 years and they've raised their dividend 60 years in a row. How would you like to get a raise 60 consecutive years? And then you jumped out of the shower, you brushed your teeth with Colgate toothpaste, Colgate Palmolive, dividend, uh, dividend is 2.1%, they've increased it by 9% annually and they've increased it 54 years in a row. You got into your F-150 truck, it was $2, back in uh, 2008, today it's 11, and it pays a 5.39% dividend, and then you stopped at your favorite Starbucks to get a latte. Starbucks was $7.23 back in March of 09. Today it's $60, this is as of about a week ago. $60 today, I say to them, this is corporate America. You're putting money in their pocket each and every day. Isn't it time that you let them put money in your pocket by owning these companies and sharing in the profits? You're doing business. You're using their products each and every day. It's time to profit off them versus them just profiting off you. So that is corporate America. So there's rules of thumb to investing in the stock market. Always, always, always have a long-term time frame. We're gonna ex examine that in a little bit more depth. Start investing early. Just remember, the market will always recover and always hit new highs, and you don't lose until you sell. It's considered a paper loss, not a realized loss, okay? So now let's look at having a long-term time frame. We talked about putting uh, some money in a savings account because your principal is guaranteed, how 
many months worth of living expenses should I have in the bank? Three to six months. Excellent. Why? Because if I go to sell after a year, there's a 26% 20, chance that my money's going to be worth less if I've invested in the stock market. If I can extend that to three years, I have an 83% chance of making money in the stock market. If I can extend that to 10 years, I have a 95% chance of having positive returns. And if I can extend it to 15 years, there's never been a 15-year period where the market's been down. So that's why we have to have a long-term time frame when investing in the market. And if we look at the gyrations, they've been pretty significant over the last 20 years. So here you see that we had a big run up prior to this period. Can anybody tell me what happened here? And this is back in 2000. What did you say? Yeah, and that was part of what? The big tech bubble, right? So that was a tech bubble. And stocks proceeded to fall 49% following that. And the NASDAQ was down 78% from peak to trough. And then stocks recovered over the ensuing few years. And then something happened again right here. What was that? The, yeah, the housing crash. And in a bigger picture, it was called the global, global financial uh, disaster. And so stocks. Um, uh, proceeded to lose 57%. That was a horrible time. I remember waking up in the middle of the night just having a panic attack. You know, we as investment professionals had to talk a lot of people off the ledge because it was such a brutal time. I mean, think about it. You're age 70, you're retired, your million dollars is now worth 430,000. And you're like, I can't go back to work. I'm no longer marketable. How am I going to make up for that? I can't cut my living expenses by 60%. So this was a, the global financial crisis was a horrible time for investors, and a lot of them were tempted to sell right down here, right? They said, I can't stomach this anymore, I'm done, I'm throwing in the towel. And so we as investment professionals had to talk people out of throwing in the towel, and look what happened after following that. If you include dividend stocks are up in excess of 300% from that time period. And again, a few, there was a few investors who did sell out of the market then. So if we look in the rear view mirror, it's real easy to say, hey, I can weather the storm. But when you're in the middle of it and you see stocks you know, plummeting, it's really hard. And that's why Peter Lynch, one of the most successful investors in our lifetime, um, Peter Lynch, the Magellan Fund, he was you know, the hero in the 80s. He said, it's the stomach, not the head, that determines the fate of the investor. So what he means is, it doesn't matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter how much knowledge you're ha you have, it's your emotional fortitude, it's your stomach that will determine whether or not you're gonna be a successful investor because everybody panics right here and they all wanna <coughs> sell out of the market. They're like, I can't take any more losses, I'm done. So that's why emotional fortitude is so critical. If we look at the market intra-year, you see a lot of volatility as well. So the numbers you see here at the top show how the market ended each year. It shows the percentage gain or loss each and every year. This shows the intra-year decline. So let me explain that. So back in 1980, the market was up 26%, but during the time, during that year, we had a 17% peak to trough decline. So if you look at the very high that year and the very lowest point, there was a 17% intra-year decline, but yet the market was up 26% at year end. Then look at 1981, the market was down 15, intra-year we had an 18% decline. 1982, the market was up 15%, and for a year we had a peak to trough, or high to low, drawdown of 17%. So bottom line, we typically experience a 14% intra-year decline, but 26 
out of 37 years, I think that's 28 out of 37 years, the market ends the year positive. So we tend to bounce back. So 75% of the time, despite a 14% on average decline, the market ends the year positive. So you can't panic when you see those declines. If anything, try to add more money when you see that. But there's a lot of volatility, you know, in the stock market. And uh, that makes investors very nervous. We talked about the importance of starting young. So here's an illustration for you. So if you're age 30 and you invest $550, am I not recording this? Or and you invest $550 a month at a 7% rate of return and you start at age 30, at age 65 you're going to have $990,000. If you just delay five years, that number decreases to $670,000. You invested $33,000 less but it amounted to $320,000 at age 65. Do you see the importance of starting young? Because you've got time on your side and the powerful impact of compounding allows you to turn 33,000 into 320,000. So that's why I urge you, the day you collect your first paycheck, obviously pay off any loans, but the day you collect your first paycheck, start setting money aside because you will be so much better off because you started early than the person who just delayed five years and it gets worse and worse and worse the longer you wait, as you can see. Also, you know, I, I tend to tell people stay away from fads, you know, like autonomous cars, like 3D printers and things like that because by the time you realize that, hey, this is a revolutionary technology, the market's already priced that in. So, for example, if you look at 3D printer stocks, they peaked five, six years ago. So just be careful with what's the, supposed to be the latest and greatest technology. The market is a whole lot smarter than you and I are, and they're going to price all those things in. And by the time you and I uncover that, it's too late. So be careful with, with fads. Not say trends, but fads. And then also Warren Buffett said, rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. So here's why you don't want to lose money. Because if I'm down 10%, I don't need to be up 10% to break even. The math doesn't work that way. Look at this. If I'm down 20%, I need to be up 25% just to break even. If I'm down 40%, I need to be up 67% to break even. If I'm down 50, I need to be up 100 to break even. So if we do the math, let's do the math with just this one. Let's say I have 100,000 and I'm down 20%. My 100,000 is now worth 80, right? I need to earn another 20,000 to get back up to 100. 20,000 is 25% of 80. So same dollar amount, different percentage. Again, let's do the math here. I've got 100,000, I lose 50%, I'm down to 50,000. I need to earn 50,000, which is 100% of 50,000. Does that, that make sense, right? So again, you know, try not to lose money, and you don't lose money until you sell. So again, it's an unrealized loss until you sell, it's a paper loss. Let's shift to international investing. So we as a country, we tend to be very myopic, and we, we tend to live in this bubble where we think the U.S. is the end all, but there's 50% of the world's capitalization that exists outside of the U.S. So if you don't have a portion of your assets invested overseas, it's like going to the grocery store and saying, I will only look at odd number aisles. I refuse to look at even number aisles. Or I will only invest in a company that's west of the Mississippi. I refuse to look at a company that's east of the Mississippi. You're missing out on half the opportunities by not looking overseas. So here's, you know, global includes the U.S., international excludes the U.S. So those are not interchangeable terms. They're different. 
So I'm going to give you a list of companies. I want you to tell me which ones are domestic, which ones are international. GE Appliance. Domestic. Domestic. Jaguar. Sorry, what? Okay, Budweiser. Samsung. Foreign. Dexo. Domestic. H and M. Domestic. Red Bull. International. Okay, Ben and Jerry's. Domestic. Trader Joe's. Domestic. Lululemon. Okay, well, you got about half of them right. <laughs> GE Appliance, Hire, China. Jaguar, Tata Motors, India. Haagen Dazs, Oakland, California. Budweiser, InBev, Belgium. Samsung, Korea, South Korea. Dove Soap, Unilever, Great Britain. H&M, Sweden, Red Bull. Thailand, Ben & Jerry's, Unilever, Great Britain, Trader Joe's, Aldi, Germany, Lululemon, Canada. Okay, so again, we tend to think that all these companies are US based, and by ignoring them, you're ignoring half of the opportunities that exist outside of the US. Okay, so let's look at foreign markets now. We tend to break down foreign markets in three ways. EFA, MSCI EFA. Most financial advisors don't know what EFA stands for. It stands for Europe, Australasia, and Far East. And it's non North American developed countries. And then we have emerging markets like China, Brazil. India, and then we have frontier markets, which are really immature markets like in Africa. So first today, we'll just look at EFA, which is developed markets outside of the US. And you can see that their pattern looks similar to ours. They had a huge run up prior to the tech bubble. And then their markets fell 56% versus ours 49. And then they had a nice run up again and then they experienced the uh, global financial crises. They were down 57%, the exact same amount as our markets were. And then look, they haven't rebounded near as much. So they're up 108%, not including dividends. We're up you know, 300% including dividends. So a lot of people say now more than ever, you should have a portion of your assets allocated outside of the US because the US is kind of frothy. Our markets are trading a little bit above average if we look at PE ratios while international markets tend to be cheaper relative to the US and relative to where they historically trade. So now is probably not the time to ignore foreign markets. And again, the percentage that you have, there's not really a consensus as to how much money you should have invested overseas. But again, their markets tend to be a little bit cheaper than ours. So let's look at diversification. So mutual funds, are one of the best ways to have diversified uh, diversified portfolio. So the key to minimizing risk is have a diversified portfolio, right? And so mutual funds allow you the opportunity to do that. So with one investment, whether it's $1,000 or $1 million, you're going to have 30, 50, 100, 1,000 different securities automatically, right? And then we talked about liquidity earlier. So you, you can call up your uh, Schwab or Vanguard or whatever, I need my money. Within three business days, you have your money. Obviously with real estate, it might take you three months, six months, a year to sell your house. <coughs> so the beauty of mutual funds is they're considered completely liquid. Now your money may be down from where you put it, but again, you can access it. The third benefit is professional management. So oftentimes managers have the tools, the resources, the time, the knowledge, the expertise, that you and I don't have. So they can pick up the phone and call Tim Cook, hey, what do your earnings look like? Or Jeff Bezos, hey, what are your revenue? What's, what do you predict your revenue to be? Now, obviously, they're not gonna call company CEOs, but they talk to analysts on a daily basis, and you guys and I, we don't have access to that. So a lot of times, mutual funds are a great way to go if you're a novice investor. And then the last one is a low minimum. So with just $1,000, you can own great mutual funds, and and the subsequent investment is just 100. Now, not all of them have those low minimums, but I called several 
multiplex companies, and they were all pretty similar, $1,000 uh, initial investment with a subsequent investment of, of $100 on a monthly basis. So that's the beauty of mutual funds, and that's why they are so popular today. But ETFs have really become popular as well, and in a much shorter period of time. So what are the differences between mutual funds and ETFs? Can anybody tell me? Yep, you buy shares, they trade throughout the day. Whereas a mutual fund, at the end of the day, they, they price all the securities and say, your mutual fund's now worth $23.18 or whatever. So at the end of the day, you get that price of the mutual funds because they calculated the closing price of all the underlying securities or stocks within that mutual fund. Whereas ETFs, throughout the day, they're priced. So if you see the market in a free fall, then you want to put, put in a buy order, um, you can do that. You know, at 11 o'clock before the market closes at 1 o'clock, whereas the mutual fund, you have to wait for the closing price that day in order to get at your price. So intraday trading, you can put a stop loss order in. Um, you know, so a financial advisor can say, hey, the reason I like ETFs is I, I can make sure that if the market drops 10%, you're out you're out automatically. Whereas a mutual fund, you can't put in a stop loss order. Or you can put in a buy limit order. So this is what I do sometimes, is um, let's say if I think the market's gonna drop and I'm not paying attention to what the percentage you know, a downturn is, I'll just put in an automatic order that's gonna be triggered anytime the market is down 10%. I don't even have to pay any attention to it. It's automatically gonna execute if the market drops 10% over a period of a month, two months, a day, it doesn't matter. So you can do that with ETFs, whereas you can't do that with mutual funds. And then there's one big difference between ETFs and mutual funds. If you want to have some questions. Yeah, so you can just put in a stop loss order just like you could with a stock that says, okay, I bought this ETF at 20. If it goes to 18, I want out. You know, sometimes investors, especially older investors, they want that protection. They want out. So the, the uh, financial advisor will say, okay, we'll put in a, a stop loss order at 18 so that if the market drops, it's triggered automatically. Yep. How would I be able to do this? How would you be able to yeah. do this? You can do this by calling Vanguard, by opening an account at Fidelity, by opening an account at Schwab. So, yeah, most. So, I would have to go through the uh, No, 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 you can go direct, you know, Meritrade, you can go to, you know, no load uh, companies, Schwab. So, or you can go through a financial advisor, but most financial advisors require a minimum of, of 250 or 500,000. But you can do this on your own. You just open an account online. Okay. Yeah. So there's one big difference between ETFs and mutual funds, and that big difference is cost. ETFs, ETFs tend to be a lot cheaper than mutual funds, and that's why they've gained in popularity. And so usually ETFs are passive. Does anybody know what passive means? Passive means that there's not a manager who's making decisions as to what stocks to buy, what stocks to sell, you're just tracking a benchmark. So you're just replicating an index. So whether it's the S&P 500, whether it's the Dow Jones Industrial Average, EFA, do you remember what EFA stands for? Europe, Australasia, Far East. So that's international developed countries or maybe the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index. So usually ETFs tend to be passive and mutual funds tend to be active. But those lines have really blurred in the last few years, and now we have active ETFs and passive mutual funds, so that's not always the case. And I don't mean to confuse you, but, but keep in mind the big differences are that ETFs, throughout the day they trade, we can, we can put in an order in the middle of the day and it'll be executed, whereas a mutual fund you have to wait till the end of the day. And the other big difference is that the costs are a lot lower with ETFs. Does benefit from the professional manager outweigh the fees than just doing it by yourself? So his question was, do the benefits of active management offset the fees? In the last 20 years, this has not been the case. It has not been the case. Now some pundits say, oh yes, but we're just going through a cycle. 
where active management is going to come back into favor. And usually if there's a big dispersion in the returns of stocks, active management does pay off when there's a big variation and a lot of volatility in stocks. When there's not, passive investing tends to make sense. But for the last 20 years, active managers have not been able to compensate for their fees and deliver returns better than the market. And that's why ETFs have gained so much in popularity. Great question. Isn't it something like 75% of professional money managers don't? Right, it? yep, exactly. It's a high percentage. So yep. if you can get one that does beat the market, then it's probably worth it. Yep. But the chance of you finding that is probably uh, low. Yes. Yeah, it's very time period dependent. It also depends on which asset class you're looking at. Like large company stocks, very few managers. I mean, the number is probably 95% of managers don't beat the market. Small companies, you know, stocks, more, more managers tend to beat the market. Emerging markets, more managers tend to add value. So it's really a mixed bag, but on average, about 75% of the managers underperform the benchmark. Okay, so one of my favorite uh, uh, concepts is called dollar cost averaging. Have any of you heard of that? So dollar cost averaging is putting a fixed amount of money into the market at regular intervals. So whether it's on a monthly basis or every three months, six months, putting a fixed amount of money at regular intervals in the market can make a lot of sense and we'll look at why. So, I'm gonna give you three scenarios. So Sally buys a 5% CD, she puts $1,000 a year over the course of five years into that 5% CD. And then we've got Louie the loser, he buys a terrible stock, it goes from 50 year one to 40, down to 30, back up to 35, back up to 40, and again he puts $1,000 a year to that stock, and then we've got Lucky Larry, a great stock picker, year one. His stock is at 50, year 255, 60, 65, 70. Who would you want to be if you had a choice? Sally. Sally? Okay. Everybody well, agrees with him, Sally? <coughs> Actually, it's Louie the loser. So Sally ends up with 5,250, Louie the loser, 6,560 and Lucky Larry 5915. How could that be? When you're investing at regular intervals and the price of your stock or mutual fund drops, you're buying more shares cheaper. So they only need to recover somewhat for you to be in the black again. So when stocks drop or mutual funds or ETFs and you're buying the same dollar amount, you're buying more shares at a cheaper price so they only need to recover somewhat for you to be in the money. So let's unpack that with a simpler example. Yeah. Dollar cost averaging is also averaging down. Yeah, it's averaging down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is a simpler example. So let's say I'm investing $300 every month for five months. Okay, so $300, my share price is 30. How many shares do I buy? 10. Okay, let's say the price drops to 10. I now buy 30 shares. The price goes up to 20, 15 shares. The stock drops back down to 15. I buy 20 shares. And then it bounces back to 25. I now buy 12 shares. So let's count how many shares I have. 10, 40, 55, 75, 87. And then 87 times the closing price of 25. Can somebody do that? 87 times 25? $2,175, thank you, okay? Now let's say it stayed at 30, okay? So 10 shares, 10 shares, 10 shares, 10 shares, 10 shares, that's 50 shares times 30 is 1,500, right? Would you rather have 1,500 or 2,175? Yet my stock dropped a 
never went back to its original price of 30, yet I have $2,175 versus $1,500. That, that is the beauty of dollar cost averaging. So when you start working and you're investing every month in your 401k, you're doing that automatically. So when the market declines, don't be upset and say, yeah, I'm buying more shares cheaper. This is awesome, right? Okay, so don't panic. That's why dollar cost averaging is, is such a great tool that's so underutilized. Um, people say, when's the best time to invest? And I just say, when the market's open. You know, it's really hard to time the market. People have done it successfully once and they've never been able to repeat that. Because you have to know when to buy, you have to know when to sell, and you have to know when to get back in. And nobody has been able to do that successfully. So don't try to time the market. It's time in the market versus timing the market that makes you a successful investor. So. We're gonna shift to asset allocation. And in order to do that, I'm gonna just spend a minute on bonds. And the reason I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time is because you're young, you have time on your side, so most experts would say that you need to have a disproportionate amount of money in stocks and not in bonds. So the way bonds work is that if interest rates are going down, sorry, then the price of bonds go up. And if interest rates are going up, the price of bonds go down. So they move in a seesaw fashion. And let's think about that for a minute. So a bond is an IOU. So I make a loan to uh, UCSD or to municipality or to the government or to a company and they guarantee to pay me my principal back at a certain date and they guarantee me a certain interest rate, right? So that's how bonds work. You're guaranteed, that's how, they're also called fixed income. If you ever hear the word fixed income, the fixed income markets, they mean the bond market, okay? So equity, stocks, the same, fixed income, bonds, the same. <coughs> so think about this for a minute. Uh, Janet Yellen decides to raise rates and you've got a 2% bond uh, and now the average rate that you can get on the market is two and a half. Is anybody going to want your 2% bond? No. So the price is going to drop. Same with if the rates go down and you have a 5% bond, rates go down to three, your bond is going to be worth more because everybody's going to want that 5% bond when the prevailing rate is just three. So that's why bond prices move in opposite direction with interest rates. Are we in a rising rate environment or are we in a declining rate environment currently? Rising. rising rate, exactly. Great job. Why? Because Janet Yellen had been raising rates over the last year, uh, year and a half or so. So the outlook for bonds, if rates rise, is that bond prices will go down. Now, if you hold your bond till maturity, you're guaranteed your principal back. So uh, the second reason is, as I mentioned to you, bonds. The return for bonds is not as good as the returns for stocks. Do you remember that illustration that we saw a little while ago? But for somebody who's 95 and isn't even buying green bananas, they don't have a 15 year time frame in which they can hold stocks, right? So they're gonna have more money invested in bonds than you will because you're not gonna retire for another 40 years or so. So the older you get, the less money experts typically will recommend you put in stocks. And there's all sorts of calculators, yeah. So the return on bonds is guaranteed, you said? Yes, the, the richest rate is guaranteed unless they go into default. Like right now, Puerto Rico is going into default. Mm. So they're not, investors who invested in Puerto Rico bonds may or may not get their money back. So um, yeah, so the way bonds work is you're guaranteed your principal at maturity. Oh.
categories. So how much should you have in stocks versus bonds versus cash? You can throw in commodities, real estate, international bonds, international stocks in the mix. You know, those are all considered different asset classes. So there's not one rule of thumb, but some experts say, well, 100 minus your age, and that's how much money you should have in the stock market. Now experts have increased that to 110, 120. So meaning you should have anywhere from, you know, 90 something percent of your money in stocks. Again, because you've got time on your side before you decide to tap into that money, hopefully. So there's all sorts of different calculators available in the marketplace today. And there's not one good one. I tend to use a lot of different calculators, like Wells Fargo has one, Vanguard has one, Bankrate has, has one. So let's take a look at how we can manipulate these numbers and what the end result is. So let's say your age, what, 20? From zero to ten, what do you want me to put? Seven, seven. Seven? And then your economic outlook, that's a little bit silly to me, but what, five? You want to say five? So, they're recommending that 94% of your money should be in the market, in the stock market. And then you should have 3% in bonds, 3% in cash. So we can manipulate this, let's say, you know, age 55. And so let's say my risk tolerance is five now. And do you see how that dropped to 57% versus 18 versus 25? So this is a great calculator. Asset allocation is a really important decision. And you should make asset allocation decisions prior to making investment decisions. And we're gonna cover that in just a second. Can I go back? Yeah. This is something you guys can control, asset allocation. Yeah. It's not the only thing you can control. Exactly right. And so Wells Fargo has a calculator that I like. Vanguard has a calculator that I like. This was a little overly simplistic because it didn't ask me questions about my risk tolerance, how much downside can I tolerate, um, how risk adverse am I, but most of those calculators will take into account all those answers before they figure out what percentage should be in stocks. But usually clients will always say, I want high returns, no risk, right? Well, we know that's simply impossible. There's risk in everything you invest in, even CDs. Remember, after taxes and inflation, we're guaranteed to lose money safely. But this is really kind of how it looks. Cash is the least risky, but you're getting the lowest return, right? And then bonds, international stocks, real estate stocks, international stocks. So the horizontal axis is risk, the vertical axis is return. So you know, ideally we want to be right here in the North Trends quadrant, and we'll see in a minute how diversification is going to help us get there. So, if we have 100% of our money in stocks, the best year uh, we'd be up 51%, the worst year down 37 If we had 100% uh, of our money in bonds, our best year up 43%, our worst year down 5 and a 50-50 mix, up 32, down 15. And that's if we had a one year time frame. Now, if we push that to a five year time frame, so if we extend that to five years, our best five year period, the stock market averaged 28% per year. Our worst five year period, just down two, was the 37. Do you see what a dramatic impact just happened there? If we're 100% invested in bonds, the worst, the best five year period, bonds were up 23% annually, the worst down two. And then a blend, uh, a 50-50 blend, up 21%. So, get, so did, do you see that? There, there's never been a five-year period in which a 50-50 mix of stocks and bonds would have yielded negative return. 
And again, we can extend that to 10 years and then 20 years. So you see that a diversified portfolio will protect you against any significant downside. But again, because you're young, you've got time on your side, you should have, you know, most experts will say, don't have 50% of your money in bonds, not at your age. So you can plug in, so this was a Vanguard, you can plug in your current asset allocation, answer all those questions, and then Vanguard will come back and say, you're out of whack. Based on how you answer those questions, we should adjust your asset allocation to being such and such. So they'll, you'll put in your, your current allocation, and after answering those questions, they'll recommend a proposed allocation. Now, here's a periodic table. This is called the Callum Periodic Table. So this shows the returns of different investments uh, each given year. So this had the highest returns, the one at the bottom had the lowest returns. So for example, REITs in 2006 were up 35% tip, which is treasury inflation protected securities were just flat. Let's look at 2015, REITs were up 2.2 and commodities were down 28. So the best, the worst. Now if you're a novice investor, this is what a lot of first time investors will do. They'll look at last year's winner and they'll invest. They'll say, ooh, I like the returns of REITs. I think I'm gonna put my money in there. But there's no predictive value in past returns. There's none whatsoever. And as a matter of fact, look what REITs did. The next year they were the worst performing category, right? And then an experienced or seasoned investor, they'll tend to buy last year's worst performing category, knowing that things move in cycles, right? And it's likely to rebound, but it may not happen. Look at commodities. Look how long commodities have been the bottom performers. What does a smart investor do? A smart investor invests in a diversified portfolio. So this is a combination of all those various asset classes. So it's really gonna smooth out the ride. It's going to minimize your volatility and smooth out your returns. Now this isn't 10% in each category. I, I didn't memorize the exact percentages, but again, it makes the case for why you should have a diversified portfolio. You're never gonna hit home runs, but you're never gonna be at the bottom. You're gonna have a much smoother ride with less volatility. So Joe said this should be the first decision you make, he said, because you can control your asset allocation. And guess what? Guess what the majority of your returns will come from? Not your investment selection, 92% of your returns come from your asset allocation decisions, not your investment uh, decisions. But yet most people make investment decisions which determines their asset allocation decision. You need to make an asset allocation decision and then make investment decisions within that, if that makes sense. Now, we have in this business what's called an efficient frontier, so we always want the maximum return for the least amount of risk, right? That's our goal, and we in the business, we look at correlation coefficient, we look at standard deviation, we look at, we look at all of these things, and there's formulas, and there's algorithms, you know, but I'm, I'm gonna simplify. So this is what an efficient frontier looks like. Again, risk on the horizontal axis, return. So bonds will give us the lowest amount of risk, but also the lowest amount of return. By incorporating stocks, I'm able to reduce my, my risk. Wait a second, stocks are more volatile than bonds. How am I able to reduce my risk by incorporating stocks into my portfolio? How could that be? Can anybody answer that? When one zigs, the other one zags they're actually negatively correlated. So stocks and bonds don't move in lockstep with each other when they tend to be negatively correlated. So that's why diversification is critical because some of these investments have low correlations to each other or no correlations to each other, and in this case, negatively correlated. So that's why diversification is so critical. 
you're lowering the volatility because they don't all move in lockstep with each other. And if all your investments are going up at the same time, guess what? You're not properly diversified. Yeah. Are the negatively correlated because when interest rates go down, uh, companies lose money? Uh, uh, not really. And this is also time period dependent, but thank you for that question. If interest rates go up, you know, stocks don't always go down. We, we looked at so many different periods. Um, and so, again, usually when interest rates rise very rapidly, it tends to be negative for the stock market because people would rather put their money in bonds to capture that higher rate than in the stock market, which is a little more risky. So that's typically why they're negatively correlated. Um, people would prefer a guaranteed rate of return versus hoping for a good rate of return in the market. Uh, but it's very time period dependent. But again, by incorporating stocks into my portfolio, I'm reducing the risk even though stocks are more volatile than bonds. And again, because investments aren't always correlated with each other. So that ends my presentation. I want to tell you one thing, how important it is to live below your means. Because I drive to Santa Barbara a lot because that's where I was living the last 14 years and sometimes I lecture up there. And I stopped at a Whataburger on my way there and, and I was horrified when I saw this, this picture. And this was Claire serving me my burger. And I tried to engage her in a conversation and she wasn't very forthcoming. You know, she was pretty private and I watched her after she served me my burger, I watched her go to the bathroom and she was really arthritic and she was limping and my heart just broke for her. I'm thinking Claire probably has great grandkids or grandkids that she'd much rather spend time with. Why is she working behind the counter making whatever, $9 an hour, I have no idea. My hope is that maybe she loves her job, but please don't be the next Claire. And you know, the majority of the population here in the US is going to be in that boat. Why? Because we're living so much longer. In the year 1900, the average life expectancy was age 49. In the year 1900, a baby born today in Monaco is expected to live to 93. So we are gonna, you guys are gonna be spending so much more time in retirement than I will. But yet your money's gonna run out. Your biggest risk is longevity risk. So don't be like the average American whose credit card debt has now exceeded a trillion dollars, whose savings rate is just 5.7%, because you will have to you know, work behind a counter, live below your means. The difference between your income and your expenses is how you build wealth. So if you forget everything I've told you in this class, the one thing I want you to remember is live below your means, and that's the only way you're gonna build wealth. Thank you very much.